that. Okay. Good morning, everybody. And for those of you in the UK, good evening. Um, I was so pleased to get an offer from the um, uh, Chippewa Valley Astronomical Society to host this evening. It's kind of bonus content because I hadn't arranged anything for August. And now we've got a, um, an evening. So without further chat from me, I'm going to hand over to um, to Peter. Peter, it's, it's all yours. Thank you very much. I hope everybody can, everybody can hear me. Oh, yes. Yep. Uh, some time ago, Paul asked us to do a, a program after one of the lectures. And like you said, the August one opened up. So we hastily got everything together to uh, get our presentation. Uh, let's see, we got some slides. We'll start out with some slides and introduce our group. Let's see, how do we do that? I'm trying to find the. Do, do. No, you second, you second. We just start there. There we go. We got the first slide up. Uh, this is the Chippewa Valley Astronomical um, Society. Can you see our screen? Yeah, you're not sharing yet. Yeah, you need to share. Share. First. Okay, one second. Yeah. One second. Where is? Oops, we got to zoom in. That. Share screen. There we go. Okay. Share. I'm, I'm new at this. I don't know what I'm doing. Yeah, that seemed to work. Bingo. So, slide Joe, start first slide. There we go, Chippewa Valley Astronomical Society. We're the group that's presenting this this evening. Uh, we were founded in uh, 1983 uh, by primarily the professor Bob Elliott from the University of Wisconsin and several other local astronomers who were extremely interested in what was going on out here. Uh, current members of the society that are in the uh, radio astronomy group are Emmett Kyle, Jeff Cole, Todd Chevrier and Brandon Dupree. There's only four of us. And unfortunately, most all of them work. I'm the only retired one in the group. So we meet uh, twice a month for about three or four hours. And so things are moving kind of slow for us. Uh, we're situated at the Beaver Creek Reserve. It's an area of, of Youth Camp Science Center, Hobbs Observatory, and, and fortunately a wildland school where young kids can learn all about nature. Where are we? Well, here is the United States. Here is the state of Wisconsin. That's the dot where we're at. And if you see here, we have uh, up on top is Chippewa Falls, Eau Claire, Altoona. And this has effectively been known as the uh, Silicon Valley of the Midwest, primarily because the uh, supercomputer industry started here with Seymour Cray and his first supercomputer, the 7600. And that was my my employer for 28 years. So I'm, I'm a little acquainted with Cray Research and that. The other uh, businesses are a business called TTM. They're the world famous maker of printed circuit boards. And uh, there was another computer company in Eau Claire, SSI, it's, uh, Supercomputer Systems Incorporated. That was a com competitor of Cray Research. And uh, the founder of that one, Steve Chen, moved to China where he is now working on his computers. Here's an overview of, of where we're at. It's a satellite view of the Beaver Creek Reserve. You can see Hobbs Observatory, the, the Wildland School. And this is a closer view of the observatory and one of our antennas. And this is the Hobbs Observatory itself. Two domes, one, uh, the one on the left has a 24 inch refractor and the other, uh, other one has a 14 inch. And we do public outreach with uh, astronomy programs. The uh, dish that we have here is the first dish that we had. Uh, former president of SARA and one of the founders is uh, Chuck Forrester. He used to visit our Chippewa Valley Astronomical Society occasionally when he flew up on business. 
and he did become a member. And one time he gave us a phone call and said, uh, I'd like to have a radio astronomy outfit up at Chippewa Falls. I've got an antenna that you might be interested in. So we traveled to the University of Wisconsin in Madison, Wisconsin, where there was a 10 meter dish that was available. And after looking at that, we said, no way in the world we're gonna get that on a, <laughs> on a trailer and get it, get it up to Chippewa. So the uh, director said, well, why don't you take the five meter dish? It's easier to do it. So we accepted the five meter dish. And unfortunately the area where it was located, it's called Radio Hill in Madison. And it contained all of the University of Wisconsin's public radio, public television, and some radio antennas. Among them was the antenna for WHA, which was the second you know, radio station on the air after KDKA in Pittsburgh. And Pittsburgh broadcasts uh, the little, little things every once in a while. But the University of Wisconsin, WHA, had outreach stations that they had. And they were actually the first radio station to do networking and actual programming. But all of those antennas had to be removed because the hill was being turned into condominiums, unfortunately. But this is our, our dish. It's a uh, five, five meter dish. Another closer look at it. There it is there. You notice the box, box that's sitting at the focal point uh, has a metal coating on the box itself is a wooden box with a cantenna mounted in the center with extruded foam around the outside and we have to do that because the temperature variation here in our location is like the other day we had 94 as a high and in the winter it's 30 below so the temperature variation is quite a bit so we have to do some some work to help the antennas this is the antenna that is exactly 100 feet east of the west dish. It's one that we received from uh, one of our Native American friends, the people up at the Lakuteray Indian Reservation. We had that as an access, access unit for their PBS download and wanted to know if we wanted it. So we took it and it's, uh, we just got it operational. If you look down on the dish, this is what's on the dish. And we were asked to leave that there because the dish is uh, went through a ceremony with the Native American Indians and it's a sacred item, so we couldn't touch it. So that's what it looks like from, from, from the pot. Oh, there. And this is the box that's on the Eastern dish. It's identically the same. It's a wooden box with the cantana with extruded foam around the outside of it and gold foil on the outside to uh, cause the sun's rays to be reflected off. And there's another, another view of it. Some of the things that we've been able to do, um, this is um, first light on the west dish that occurred in uh, 2004. And it was on a frequency of 775 megahertz. That's the frequency that Chuck Forster uh, designed in his receiver, kind of loosely based on the Sarah 800 megahertz receiver. And the uh, th three people that were there was uh, Jim Fitzel, no longer with us, Jeff Cole, one of our current members, and myself were the ones that, that got this one going. Uh, some other things that we've gotten, this is a, a solar pass through the west dish, but the spikes we confirm are part of this big solar flare that occurred and that's the reason the signal is in such bad shape. This is a typical recording that we do we usually do three three day four day recording. Uh, this is sun passing in the Milky Way and this is before the, uh, the data is manipulated so that we can actually see something decent. Uh, this is another recording that we had um, um, unfortunately we see the should have been four spikes there and the third one was kind of low so we just took and spread the the data out and come to find out it, was, it occurred at exactly the same time at the partial solar eclipse at, at that time so we actually were able to record that which is kind of a, kind of a nice thing for us the uh, west dish is is operating 
now, and uh, this is a pass just recently, on uh, July 27th, a uh, recording of the sun. It's pointed high to get signals A group, but it does, it's large enough, it pick, does pick up the sun. And we did, in spreading this out and looking at it, we do have the Cygnus A group and the Milky Way that's on the side of it and the other side of the Milky Way as it, as it scans through. We are pointed 180 degrees south, so we just changed the altitude so we do a drift scan of the whole sky. And that's, this is showing that. Wrong button. And this is a, a closer view of that, of the Cygnus Alpha signal and the Milky Way that's real close to it. I was going to have a picture showing from radio eye the exact positioning of these two items, but it, Murphy was here and we weren't able to scan it. Oh, got this one, it did come in. This is what we had here, the, the blob on the right-hand side is Cygnus A, and the group on the right is the uh, Milky Way that happens to be close by it, and if you go over far to the left is the other other section of the, the Milky Way that's showing. And we were able again to, uh, on July of this year, to pick up a solar flare. The main spike in the center is a solar flare, which is kind of exciting. That's it for our, my slides right now. And I'm going to turn Let's see if we can get out of this. Stop share. Okay. There. I'm going to turn it over to the engineering department <laughs> consisting consisting of Emmett Kyle and Jeff Cole. And they're going to go through some of the electronics uh, that we're currently using here. Take it over. So there's the screen sharing. Okay. I'll close out screen share. I'll get out of your way. this very often to get lost. So can everybody see this image of a can? Yeah, that's Looks fine. Good. Okay. So this is the can antenna that we came up with. Um, we did this about three years ago. We had a uh, astro radio astronomy workshop and we had about 10 or 15 people show up for it and we made like 20 of these cans. Um, you can see the probe sticking out on the left side uh, goes, it's coupled directly into the, the base of the LNA. So there's no loss, no cable loss between the, the probe and the, and the LNA. Um, let's see, we got most of these parts. Um, we were able to get samples from uh, Richardson Electronics. Yep. We could send more info about that. I don't know if you can see this or not. That's backwards. Uh, yeah, I'm going to do the camera later. Do that later. Yeah. Um, let's see what device is that. We use two, the, the can has uh, two LNAs in it um, and a, a hairpin filter that was right on the circuit board. So it has about 24 dB of gain, but um, the hairpin filter needs to be optimized more. There's a little more loss than we'd like, but it does work fairly well. And this thing is fed either by a USB adapter or through the BIAS-T. 
And since we had some of these cans left over, we used them, we decided to use them for our two dishes. Our original setup had a lot of, uh, had really good LMAs, but they were unstable and we had a lot of un unexplained variations in the, our signals. And once we went to this, with the filter in our new receiver, which has even more filtering, um, the signals are a lot cleaner. Let's see. Where is trying to get to the next image here? Is that the stack thing? No, it's not. Uh, it's individual pictures. Yeah. So just go to the next one. Okay, so this is um, the cantena again, and then we just got this. This is our internal receiver. The test signal. Uh, there's two power supply stuff is on the left, and then there's two bias T's in the back, and then two uh, interdigital filters for bandpass filters for the two channels. Let's see. Let's see. Um, this was a test signal that that set up is shown 14 20 megahertz and that shows the filter band pass kind of a bad picture but let's see what else here. um okay so what we've been using for a long time is we have a Hewlett packard um, classic 8568b spectrum analyzer that was given to us by a uh, Technical College. Um, it was originally government surplus. Um, we've been using it as our, our main receiver, and we set it, you know, to fourteen twenty megahertz, and then resolution bandwidth of about one megahertz, and then we use it in a zero frequency span of zero hertz mode, so it becomes the output becomes a time domain, and then the output this. Uh, spectrum analyzer was originally set up for an XY plotter. So the, the video output is actually the, the amplitude scale. And we take that video output and we send it through a, we have uh, two data acquisition boxes that we custom made. Um, and inside the box, there's an ABD converter that converts it into digital data. Uh, two boxes, there's one on the West dish and it has it's basically a mini weather station. It has barometer, temperature, humidity, and then it has an inclinometer so we can um, see our antenna elevation. And that sends the data inside to the internal bo inside box and the inside box combines the antenna data with the signal data. And then it's connected to a PC and it responds to radio sky pipe commands. So we use radio sky pipe to record. We can record the antenna data plus the weather and the ele antenna elevation. Um, both of the boxes use uh, off the shelf stuff. Uh, I like both of them use Arduino CPUs and then we have a BME 280 temperature barometer sensor and then a EDXL 345 accelerometer in the outside box. Um, so this is a typical boring display that we have, um, spectrum analyzer. But you see the sweep is like 1500 seconds, but that's irrelevant because we're just constantly sampling the data with the ADC. Let's see this next picture. Uh, this is our current setup with the, the data acquisition box on top. It's kind of, kind of washed out. I got a better picture of it. Let's see. Okay, this is a, a readout of the data acquisition box internally. We have all the, the elevation and then the temperature, barometer, humidity, 
And then the channel zero is our antenna data coming from the spectrum analyzer. And that's the number is an ADC count from zero to 4096. And this is uh, the data being fed into radio sky pipe. We have the elevation and temperature and humidity data down here. And then this is the actual receiver data. So I've been working on these filters for quite a while. These are two interdigital filters that we're currently using. Uh, I've made it with just, I, I designed them with um, software that's just out there, free software. Um, it's pretty amazing. You can just plug in the values and it gives you the dimensions. There's another picture of the internals. So this one's a five stage. Um, this gold color is not brass. It's actually uh, aluminum with a allodyne coating on it. So it's conductive, stays conductive. And the antenna feed is a couple right to the right to the bottom of the one of the elements. And so this presents a dead short to anything except 1420 megahertz. So this helps with our lightning protection. So everything on one side is connected outside, and the other side is connected inside. Um, the power supplies that feed the dishes are separate from the power supplies for the internal amplifiers. So this helps provide some isolation and it's also a really good filter. Here's a frequency response of one of those filters. It's about, I think, what is it? 25, 20 megahertz wide bandpass. But it's very, very, works very well. This is another set of filters I was playing with. I got from uh, the design from uh, a paper called Microwave Know-How that's available on the net. And this is a probe type filter. Um, it has a little, little more loss and um, about the same, a little less frequency response is not quite the same, of course. Let's see, here's another picture of it with the two, two elements. And these, these SMA connectors just have a probe tip on the other end, so they're capacitively coupled to the filter elements. There's another picture of the two tuning elements or tune with, with a screw at the base. Well, And this is a frequency response on one of those filters. It's fairly decent. This is another image of the our current receiver that we we just got going. Um, this is before I added the power splitters and stuff. The, the two two boxes on the upper left are the the bias T's, and then they feed into the two large uh, filters, and then the output of the filters go into two LNAs, and then there are more splitters after this and more amplification stages now. This is a picture of our current setup with um, two more LNAs and then the, the splitters, but we split both channels. So we have a, we can tap off either uh, dish output and then the other side of the splitter goes into another set of amplifiers and then goes into another splitter used as a combiner. And this will be our interferometer output. Um, currently, we're still, we're really close to getting an interferometer set up. I'm still lacking. Um, I can, I still need to come up with an amplitude um, control for both channels and also phase phase control plus a 180 degree phase shifter to make a phase switch interferometer. Still working on that aspect. 
And we're also um, converting over to a SDR play receiver. And I have, we have the basic receiver working with GNU radio, but we have a lot of software development to do yet. For recording data and you know, all the fine, fine details. And okay, this is a basic block diagram of what we have currently. We have the west dish and the east dish, um, the antenna can, and then internal to the can antenna are two LNAs, uh, plus a air pin filter. This is inside the building. We have the bias T, separate power supply. So if it gets zapped by lightning, it doesn't take out anything else. We have had lightning issues with the data acquisition the weather station out there. Since it's not wireless, we use RS-485 to communicate between the outside box and the inside box for the weather station. Um, so that yeah, it goes into those two inner digital filters, another LNA, so homemade splitters, spectrum analyzer, output goes to an A to D and then to the PC that runs the Radio Sky Pilot. And the other channel we just have experimentally right now, we have an SDR play receiver hooked up to a Linux PC. And then we have two more LNAs on the right and then they will get combined in for the interferometer setup. And the last image I have is just a picture of one of the homemade splitters. Again, it was designed, I think this was designed, I can't remember. So with some readily available software on the net. Um, let's see. So that's all I have for images. Um, let's see, what was this here? Where's that? Where's that? Screen share, stop share. Okay, very good. Thanks, Emmett. Um, and the signals from each of the dishes going into the, uh, the building, we have 200 feet of 7 eighths inch semi-rigid coax. That's our feed line. And uh, it seems to be working pretty good. The, the signals are, are, are quite clean. Uh, Emmett uh, had mentioned that we had looked for some input for the LNAs, and we did some searching. And I, I find out that uh, my cousin is the president of Richardson Electronics Limited. And so I contacted him and he gave us oodles of samples to use. And in talking to him just the other day, he said uh, those people who are interested in getting samples could go to their website. Let's go right now. Oops, coming up backwards. It's uh, Richardson Electronics, and their, their email address is R-E-L-L-P-O-W-E-R. -E -E I'll give it to you again. R-E-L-L-P-O-W-E-R. -E Peter, can I interrupt you? Um, yes. It might be better to put that information in the... Um, oh, my video is definitely wonky um it might be better to put that information in the chat and then we can just copy it okay yeah we could do that yeah but he's he said that he does have one person specifically assigned to take care of any requests for uh, radio astronomy people that want parts sample parts from their line card which you can see at that r-e-l-l -L. and other than that we hope this was quite interesting and we hope this is the first of many of these little show and tell units because we get mail from all you guys out there with your, your charts and your what you're doing, but we never see who you are or where you're at. Maybe, maybe we can get some more people to do a show and tell so we can get a little bit more acquainted with you guys. Oh. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, whoops. Just gonna put the address in. Shut. 
How long will it be before you hope to get some data from the interferometer? <laughs> Hopefully within the next month or two. Oh, uh, do keep are, you, uh, are, you, are you guys doing anything uh, other than uh, hydrogen alpha, the hydrogen line stuff, or um, have you, you know, like sort of, uh, well, uh, any any other? Um, uh, we we were playing around with. Uh, I still have some some hardware for 408 megahertz that we've been working on. Um, I kind of dropped that. But, because we were focusing mainly on getting the 14, 20 megahertz going. We do have some, some LNAs and some uh, bandpass filters or helical bandpass filters for 408, but we haven't really done much with it. Okay, the, the chat thing has the uh, Richardson Electronics uh, email address and, and the one, there's one person that's totally responsible for all of this, but if, if you need uh, samples, uh, they request you get your name, email address, and whatever affiliation you have with Sarah or BEAA or observatory or HAM or self, and send that to me, and I'll coordinate with them. And this is the P Pelican 2206 is my email address. But if you go on that relpower.com, you can take a look at their line card to see what, what products they handle. I was told the turnaround time is going to be very fast if they have the parts available. And they, in looking at their line card, it looks like they have uh, maybe a hundred and some places around the world where they have offices. And one of them is in uh, Lincoln, England. It's a big office over there. And they have them in, in uh, Germany and uh, a few other countries over there across the sea. So if you're interested, just give me a Give me a drop on the email and I'll see what I can do for you. And these are the LNAs that you're currently using. Is that right, Peter? Yes. Yes. Me, uh, uh, just a second. Let's see, what is it? Make, get the, get, get yeah, the it's a, just a second. I can write it down in the chat. Yeah, if, you could, if you've got the model, the model of uh, LNA that you've got. All right. Seventy. Yeah, they're they're not the state of the art LNAs, but they work pretty well. I think they have a noise figure of about 0.6 dB. Um, what helps is we have the probe directly on the, the input to the LNA, so there's no cable loss. Like before, we had a, an LNA of 0.3 dB noise figure, but then there was like three tenths of a dB in the, the cable from the probe to the LNA. So it helps when you've got a five meter dish as well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the person that's going to be handling all of these requests that if, if, when you talk, when you get in touch with, with, that person, uh, they'd be willing to give you advice on if there are some better units out there than what you're requesting, or if you, or you can work with them on on what you want. If you have locked up in the chat is all the information. Thank you very much. Oh, another question. Yeah, Alex. Yes, can I ask a question about uh, different feeds? Um, I'm not convinced there's there's true reciprocity between transmit and receive. Is, uh, is there any advantage between you're using a quarter wave between that, let's say a dipole and a full wave loop? Are there any differences in, in efficiency between these two, these three different designs? Not real up on, on that aspect. Um, we're just using the quarter wave, you know, wave guide. Didn't you experiment with some loop Yagis for your? Uh, yeah, that was the Yagi though. Yeah, it wasn't a, a dish feed. 
Alex, that sounds like a great question for the SARA forum. There's some uh, very good people there that will be able to answer that question, I'm sure. I asked and I never got a response. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> Emmett is looking up that software from the question in the chat. Have you got any regrets about not trying to, uh, not moving the 10 meter dish? Uh, <laughs> other, other than money, money, <laughs> transportation, yeah. Um, just, a, just a minute. Ah. Yeah, it's pretty it. big when you see it. Just a minute here. I got I got it. It looks small on my screen. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, that one's a cassock right? Yeah. Okay. Well, he's doing that. Let's see. Mm, that's there, a pretty there, decent size. A comparison of a person standing there and the and the dish. There's a lot of metal there to be moved if we did it. No, it I don't. I don't. I don't. I don't, I, don't regret, I don't regret that we took the five. I'm happy with the operation of it. Yeah. So I got a question. The. The wood box around your feed horn. Yes. Does it only have insulation in, or do you have heaters or fans or anything in? No heaters or anything else. It's just a sprayed in expandable foam that seems to work real good. We've had not too much variation with the temperature variation. But the idea okay. of heating and cooling is not probably not a bad idea. What um what's what's your process for calibration? Do you have um in the, like a, a tree or or do you have actual source that you calibrate it on or? Moist generator. Yeah, we do have a moist generator. We have moist generator here. Just a small probe. And, and uh, is that actually built into the into the um uh, focal point or or rather in, on the back of the dish or or do you actually have to point the dish at at, at the at it to? Actually, uh, our uh, original one did have the probe, but right now we we still need to add the calibrator for the, the new setup. We haven't done that yet. Right. Especially when you've got the fluctuation of uh, you know the big temperature fluctuation, you've got to sort of get a, get the baseline, and it's uh, sometimes. You know, you don't know quite know where you are with it. It's, uh, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, we, we, with with our dish, we we have a, a, a well, we just point at a tree, which gives you a relatively um, stable, depending on, on the outside temperature. But it's it's not bad as a, a, as they go for for giving you a um, some sort of idea of, of of the temperature of the of the system. But uh, at least the temperature varies over a few months, and not not, not suddenly. Yeah, yeah. There you go. Any other question? Uh, yeah, I have a question. Uh, have you considered uh, moving frequency to uh, either 1612 or 1658 and looking at uh, uh, OH masers? That shouldn't be too far for your, your receiver, uh, maybe just a, a slight different. It's been a thought, but the, I think we want to make sure we get this thing working, working the right way first and then concentrate on that. There were a couple other frequencies that we wanted to look at too. So, so again, no, 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 uh, 
no thought of uh so currently you only have elevation on your uh on your dishes you don't have yes, acid right, that's right yep right. when you do south exit south and then elevation right let yeah. let the let the earth rot the, the, the sky rotation take care of it so on that uh on that uh on that cygnus uh, uh map that you showed how did how did you get the uh the uh the two dimensions on that on the pass for okay. uh, sky oh sky, <laughs> sky eye we use sky eye coordinate sky eye and sky pipe data yeah that that color data isn't actually our data that's that's from uh from CAN program that shows us where the where the uh okay. most active objects are in the sky and sky eye is quite it's quite active accurate from what we've been able to determine. It's basically a planetarium program for uh, radio astronomy. And it's available from the same people that make radio sky pipe. Are there any more questions for our team? Uh, if we're reaching the end of questions, I've just got one slightly off topic one. I promised I would ask this. Do you get bears or other wildlife into your observatory? <laughs> I'm not sure how rural you are. Deer, we got a lot of deer. Mm -hmm. Deer have been known to show up. Yep, they have, uh, <laughs> I haven't seen any, but we've heard, heard rumors of that. And there's wolves, wolves and coyotes. Fun, coyotes. Yeah, you are you are you are quite rural then. Yes, we are very rural. A lot of mice. Yeah, mice. mice. <laughs> yeah, we, we had to build a we had to build a fence around our dish because the sheep kept nibbling at the cables. So. <laughs> yeah. That that seven eighths cable we have is totally buried, so we we're not too worried about, about that. We have to thank the uh, self cell phone tower people that donated that to us. It seems to work quite well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was a result getting that, I'm sure. <laughs> okay, um, thank you. Uh, was there anything else? No, I was, I, I was just going to say thank you so much for, um, for sharing your, um, your results, your instrumentation, ingenuity with us this evening. Um, do keep us posted as to when you get first light from the interferometer. I'd be very interested to... Um, to, to, to see that, do do stay in touch. Um, we'll do that. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Um, from me, good night and enjoy the rest of the evening or the rest of your day if you're in the USA. Take care now, <laughs> bye bye. Thank you. Thank, thank you very you much. Everyone. Thank bye -bye. you. Bye. Thanks guys, bye. <laughs>